Objectively, I'm trying to portray the process of thought um, and all of the stuff that goes on in your head when you think about things. Like, for example, if I were to say your mother's name, you might picture your mother's face, but you're also going to include all of this other information about her, what her hair looked like at any given time, um, you know, her favorite clothes. Uh, the way that she smelled. It's not even all visual information, you know, the way her voice sounded. And that's, you know, just the stuff that's specific to her. There's also going to be all this other analogous data that just comes with that simple suggestion. What I'm really trying to do visually is at least address all of that activity that's going on in our mind. I share my studio with three other artists in a, a, I think it was an old mattress factory in St. Paul. I went to college at the College of Visual Arts in St. Paul where I was an illustration major. Once I graduated from college, I didn't really want to go down that path of being a full-time illustrator, but I still wanted to paint and I still wanted to create images. One of the artists that I was really taken by was Robert Rauschenberg, who's very famous for his assemblage works. He would use a lot of layered imagery, but combine it all in a very weird, confusing way, and I was very taken with that. A mixed-media painter uh, would be someone who uh, uses Different mediums all together. Uh, I use acrylic and ink and elements of collage and photography uh, all together in the same space. I begin typically by assembling some Im images, generally start with photography, stuff that I've shot or stuff that I've collected. On the computer I'll combine it, working with you know opacity and layers and, and multiplying layers and overlays uh, to ways that I think are just interesting structurally and compositionally. I typically don't really think about what the images are going to have in common with one another, but I am usually looking for a few different general types that I'll want to combine together. I think Tom Waits once said something with the effect of how all you needed to write a song was the name of a girl, the make and model of a car, and a town. And you know, similarly, I'll, I'll typically start with some sort of figure, something industrial, and maybe something in between there also. And when I have something that I'm happy with, I'll have that output onto a larger piece of paper, usually like 24 by 30 inches is uh, what I can get away with. Print it on a laser printer, then use a uh, gel medium to coat that paper with. Since the image is actually printed with a laser printer, it uses toner, um, which transfers nicely from the paper to the gel. The gel, you know, it doesn't seep into the fibers of the paper. The toner, it's, you know, unlike ink, which actually stains the paper, the toner rests on top of it. And so the gel is able to pull as much of it as possible from the paper. But the idea is to get this as thin as possible, get as much of that supporting paper off of it as possible. We do this by soaking the image in water for 15 to 20 minutes and get it really saturated. And then we'll pull it out and flip it over and it just with our hands just start rolling the paper off. I'm using the brush to pick up some of the thinner layers of paper that my fingertips can't quite get. So after I've removed all of the excess paper, I, I am left with uh, the image imprinted onto this sheet of gel. And after both sides are dry, then I will be able to mount it 
to the wood or canvas. In this case, we're gonna use wood. It's just basically a, it's a glue-like polymer. It's used a lot in book binding. It's a real nice, solid adhesive. It doesn't bubble up. After I press this for a certain period of time and it cures, I will be able to paint on it. One of the things I like about the process is that it is decorative in that you lose a lot of definition as the process goes on. And then ultimately you're taking what you have left over and creating something kind of new, but still related to its source, which I think mimics the thought process. I want people to feel comfortable interacting with my pieces. I've gone out of my way to invite people touching them in the past. I had done pieces that had an actual moving spindle that they had to touch. And that was actually one of the challenges showing that work was getting people to break through that wall to actually, you know, I, I would I would have to walk by and, you know, spin it in front of people before they'd be like, oh, and then they would do that themselves. It's just one of those things that we're so well trained to keep distance. And, and which is great when you're dealing with stuff that's hundreds of years old, that's necessary, but I think it's building up an unnecessary wall. Working with this process and thinking so much about how I think, I don't think it's changed the way that I think, but it's changed the way that I think about how I think, if that makes sense. So we don't spend a lot of time sitting around and thinking about the way that we think. It's just unnatural and kind of confusing, but when I do try to do that now, it looks like these images that I'm creating. I, and I think that is really more because I've now established that in my mind as, oh, this is what this looks like. So when I need to call up an image of me thinking, I have one. Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.